my name is Bruce Hamery, and I'll be moderating this session. We greatly appreciate each of you taking time from, uh, I know, the end of a busy work day and from time with your families to join us in this uh, conversation. We really want to hear from each of you about the experiences you have exper you've had, your patients have had, your families have had in obtaining and uh, having uh, healthcare in Vermont. And the purpose will be really be to spend the majority of the evening uh, listening to you. So uh, in housekeeping, I'd ask uh, just three things. One, please stay on mute until you're ready to speak. When you are ready to speak, please raise your hand with that little gizmo at the bottom of the screen and we'll call on you in order. And secondly, we have a, a moderate number of participants on the, on the call, so please try to keep your comments reasonably brief. We're gonna go through a very short set of slides to introduce the process and what we're trying to do, um, introduce our, our team a little bit, and then we'll spend the majority of this two hours listening to you and getting your advice, input, and experience. Gretzel, next slide, please. Okay, so Act 167 passed by the state legislature last year requires the Green Mountain Care Board working with the Agency of Human Services to conduct a data-informed, patient-focused, community-inclusive engagement process aimed at helping Vermont's hospitals reduce inefficiency, lower costs, I would say con constrained cost growth, <clears throat> pardon me, improve population health outcomes, reduce health inequities, and increase access to essential services while maintaining uh, capacity for emergency. Green Mountain Care Board has asked Oliver Wyman, the team I'm leading, to do this. And so what we're doing is uh, down below, we are conducting listening sessions of both the general public, uh, the provider community writ large, including nurse practitioners, nursing home people, EMTs, pharmacists, physical therapists, and uh, dentists, other uh, health professionals you can think of, um, as well as legislators, members of disenfranchised and groups suffering from um, inequity, hospital boards uh, and hospital uh, leadership groups, as well as others. So we're involving all these groups in uh, listening sessions and trying to learn uh, what is going well, what is not going well, if, if uh, the case is either well or not well, why, and how could things be improved. We're conducting these meetings uh, now through, uh, just through uh, November 25th, Thanksgiving Day. Uh, we conducted roughly 100 last month. We have about another 50 in the next three weeks, just to give you a sense of scale. At the end of this time, we'll take the information that you give us, combine it with a lot of state uh, reports on um, workforce, mental health issues, housing issues, inequity issues, IT plan, state health plan, data from the Green Mountain Care Board, Department of Census, and so forth, and uh, construct some options which can, um, uh, which we we expect will assist in achieving the goals I, I outlined a moment ago. Those options will then be subjected to extensive analysis over the winter. We'll come back in uh, early spring, late winter, and take the results of the analyses, uh, potentially reformulate those uh, suggestions, and then we will come to your communities in person to deliver those. So we'll meet uh, my team and I with your uh, hospital leadership group and the board. And then we'll conduct a general uh, meeting of the community in my area, Massachusetts, called town meeting, but something similar in person to get feedback on what those uh, 
proposals and options might be. We'll then take that information back, reformulate those options as needed, and then present that in a final report to the Green Mountain Care Board and the legislature. So repetitive process, opportunity at several points for input. By the way, we have also spoken with a number of the leaders, directors, and so forth of the various state agencies. We still have some of those to go. Next slide, Gretchen. As I said, my name is Bruce Hamry. I trained as a physician. I've been in this uh, practice teaching, administrating, and now consulting for over 50 years. Uh, I uh, was professor and associate dean at Penn State and then ran the university hospital and then moved to Geisinger, where I was the system chief medical officer and ran the clinical side of the house, which was three hospitals, group practice of about 1,500 physicians and advanced practice people, 70 clinic sites, and a budget of about uh, 3 billion. My colleague in this is Ms. Elizabeth Sutherland. Elizabeth has her master's in systems engineering from MIT. She's worked with me and my partners at uh, Oliver Wyman for 10 years in the areas of healthcare redesign. <clears throat> she also uh, has expertise in uh, health inequity. She staffed the Pennsylvania Governor's Commission on Inequity in Healthcare and has done similar work in California and San Francisco. Our engagement manager is Mr. Sam Winter who has a rough a little over 10 years of experience in healthcare consulting and has been with us at uh, Oliver Wyman for a little over three years. Dr. Ch Chidera Chiweki is a neuropharmacologist with uh, research in alcohol and tobacco dependency, has spent uh, a little over two years at Oliver Wyman working with governmental payers, Medicare and Medicaid, and Ms. Gretchel Gonzalez, who's uh, running this meeting behind the scenes, is handling a great deal of information and logistics around uh, this effort. Next slide. So here's the plan. We're going to do a very short context setting, spend the vast majority of the time hearing your comments, experiences, and advice, and then we'll give you a few ways to continue to let us know your thoughts and, um, and any additional information you'd like. Next slide. So this just says what you already know. Uh, things in the US and in the state in healthcare are generally not going well. Uh, hospital and healthcare costs are going up, given, uh, driven by not only costs of supplies and drugs, but also by staffing costs. There are shortages of every sort of healthcare professional imaginable, including uh, workers in the cafeteria and housekeeping departments. McDonald's uh, pays more in many instances. Hospitals have unsustainable margins and families are unable to afford care. And I'll show you data on that in a minute. So certainly in Vermont, this threatens the stability of the healthcare system writ large and certainly the hospitals and the smaller hospitals in particular. Operating margins are declining, days cash on hand are declining, and we've spoken to two, at least two of the hospitals in the state who have triggered bond covenants because of one or the other of these issues. And as you, uh, as you know, if you trigger a bond covenant and don't get it fixed, somebody else runs the hospital. Patient access and wait times are terrible and have not gotten better over the last year and a half at least. Next slide. Vermont's been very successful at getting people insured. Vermont has just a little over one third the rate of uninsured people as the US uh, in, at large, but of people under Medicare age, 40% with insurance are considered underinsured. That is, they can't afford the out-of-pocket expenses for copays, deductibles, prescription drugs, or over-the-counter meds. So they avoid healthcare or delay getting it. Next slide. 
This shows the economics of it. U.S. Census in 2020 found the median income for a family of four in Vermont was a little over $67,000. When you deduct the, the uh, state and federal income tax, the family's taking home a little over $43,000 a year. And if you look below, if the family and the employer can afford the, uh, the total premium for a, a platinum plan, uh, that's uh, almost $40,000 a year. That has the lowest uh, deductible and copay, but still, if someone in that family is sick, shown on the lower right, the family could expect to pay as much as $5,000 out of pocket for their medical expenses. And remember, that's out of a, a, a total family net income of about 43,000. So huge amount of money. Next slide. This is the wait times. This is the survey done by secret shopper telephone method about 18 months ago. Uh, you see the range of times in days from 21 to 87. Uh, during this time, we did hear uh, stories of people waiting six to 12 months and more for needed medical care. Certainly been hearing those stories in our conversations uh, this fall as well. Next, next slide. Okay, so this is the last slide before we show you a couple of general discussion questions. We've talked about the House rules. I would add only that you should feel free to make comments or offer questions on the chat. We'll be monitoring that. We've also had people send us web links and that sort of thing to information. I'll promise you we do look at those. So if you wanna do that, that's uh, certainly appropriate. The, uh, we're, we're not able to talk about individual instances. This is a provider group, but just need to say that if anyone has a specific issue they need help with, um, it, the appropriate way to get that is to talk to the uh, state healthcare advocate phone number and uh, website are listed. Next slide. Okay. So a couple of, uh, of general questions that we'd like to get your thoughts and uh, comments on. What issues are you encountering that limit your ability to provide care to more people? What issues need to be addressed to make healthcare more efficient and affordable to people? What problems are your patients and their families or your family having in, get, in obtaining uh, preventive services and medical care. And if your patient needs help from somebody else, specialist, social service agency, whoever, what do you have to do to get that for them? And who do you have that does it? And how long does it take? How might we improve health equity? We're hearing uh, certainly a lot of issues around uh, poverty, rural locations, transportation, um, gender inequality, language difficulties, ethnicity, those sort of issues. What sort of issues are your patients experiencing? Um, and certainly if you could uh, had a blank sheet of paper, money was no object and uh, you were king of the world, what would you do to make things better? Uh, not sure uh, that approach will work, but we would certainly be interested in uh, knowing your thoughts. So. With that, I'm gonna stop and uh, wait for hands to raise or uh, people to sign on by face and wave. I know you have more to say than this, so please. Ah, Dr. Greenberg. All right, I'll, I'll go ahead and get started, I guess. Um, my name is Matt Greenberg. I'm an emergency physician here at Central Vermont. I moved to the state in 2010. 
Um, I had about five years in practice prior to that. So I've got a little over 20 years under my belt. Um, I've seen tremendous changes in medicine over this time, um, some for the good and some for the bad. Um, I see problems these days that we never experienced in Vermont and were only heard of 20 years ago in big inner city hospitals. Yeah. Um, There's so many areas that I think we are in need of. I don't even know where to begin. Um, I think you mentioned that we need every kind of professional and non-professional out there. And I think you're right. I think this state needs more. I think one thing in particular, two two points I'll try and make in particular. Um, I think going against some of the grain, I think we need more inpatient hospital beds. Um, you know, I look back at some of my earlier training, thinking about um, business models and the theory of constraints and looking at where bottlenecks are. And a lot of our bottlenecks are down end stream and it, it backs up all the way through the system. Mm-hmm. And if you don't have places for people to go, then they back up. And right. you know, I'm sort of bridging in the emergency department, I'm bridging inpatient and I'm bridging outpatient. And, and frankly, I feel like I'm kind of in a unique position, all, all of us ER docs are, and that we see everything. We take care of everybody, newborns, 105 year olds, women, men, OBGYN, trauma, medicine, infection. So this global perspective and just seeing how things have just come to gridlock, whether it's we don't have enough psychiatric beds, so we're boarding multiple psychiatric patients, which means I have less beds to see medical and trauma patients. Um, One of the other things besides pure hospital beds is an incredible lack of nursing home beds. You know, Vermont has, I think on the last check, the second oldest population in the country behind Maine. I see so many very, very elderly, frail elderly patients, and I have nothing to offer them. They come in, their families can't take care of them, or they're living alone in a trailer that they've lived in for 65 years, and there's no place for them to go. Um, I can't admit into the hospital because there are no beds and they don't need admission criteria. My care management can't find nursing home beds. So there's this huge lack of places to go. And I think one thing that sort of public health perspective in general has not taken into account when we talk about trying to increase efficiencies is one of the side effects of the great gains that we have had in medicine is less people are dying. And so we are, we have selected out sicker patients that are now in the system that 30 years ago simply would be dead. Um, And that's a great thing. We're saving lives, we're decreasing morbidity, but there are people walking around now that never would have lived for a month, never mind 10 extra years. And whether that's people with severe cardiac disease, people with organ transplants, whether it's newborns that were born immature or premature rather, um, you know, it's pretty routine to save 24 week preemies these days. Whereas, you know, 30 years ago, that was unheard of. So we have, we're saving more lives, but we're adding more complex, very expensive Mm -hmm. patients to the population. And inherently, we're going to need more resources, more beds, et cetera, to take care of them. You know, for a while, we were improving medical care and improving efficiency. And in some ways, we may have almost hit peak efficiency for some things. You know, in the old days, for example, appendicitis. You know, when I was in training, appendicitis was a three-day admission. Um, Appendicitis now is you get your surgery and you go home. Mm -hmm. Um, a little bit before my time, a myocardial infarction was at least a week in the hospital. Now you get your cath and you're maybe, home, yeah, two weeks, maybe. Now you get your cath and you're home, you know, maybe the next day. And, yeah. and we're saving people and people are going back and forth to the cath lab four or five times. They might have seven, nine stents. Yeah. It's amazing medicine, but it means our patient population is complex. Mm-hmm. And when we come back to Vermont, you add complex patients that are very, very old um, with very few or less young, healthy people to balance out that insurance pool. And it becomes very difficult. Right. I'll just throw, I know I'm taking a lot of time. I'll throw two more issues out there. Homelessness, 
can't believe how many homeless people are in Vermont. It seems too cold to be homeless in Vermont, but our, our numbers of homeless people that we're seeing in the, v, in the emergency department is outrageous. And again, the amount of resources trying to find places for them, you know, just a warm bed to sleep in at night. Um, it's, it's rough. And in particular, central Vermont has a very large population of homeless and universally they have mental health problems, physical health problems, past trauma, um, and often substance abuse. I'm fortunate that I work at central Vermont where we have actually really amazing substance abuse resources. It's the one shining light that I've seen improve in resources where most of our other resources have declined in recent times. Um, and transportation is one other thing I'll just throw out there is that the need of transportation in this region is terrible. Um, it is pretty much a routine and I, I even hate to say this, but there's nothing around it. People don't have cars and often at night don't have people to call. There are people routinely just spending the night in our waiting room because mm. they have no way to get home. They came in mm. by ambulance and there's no way. There are no cabs. There's no Uber. There's no way to get these folks home. So transportation is a huge issue, both getting people in and out of the emergency department and also um, in and out of their own primary care visits. Um, there are a lot of other issues, but I'll, I'll stop there and let other people talk. Thank you very much. Very informative. A lot of problems. We, by the way, we are looking at the whole ecosystem. So this is because I understand what you just said, right? That a lot of what brings people to the ED or the hospital happens before the hospital because of stuff they can't get. Same going home or elsewhere. So thank you very much. Dr. Stafford. Hi, thank you very much. Um, I want to first of all, first of all, say thank you for for having these listening sessions, um, and I want to thank uh, Dr. Greenberg, who I worked with for many years, um, for for all of his thoughts. Um, I think he really hit many of the nails on the heads. Um, I just for background, um, I'm a recently retired family doctor um, uh, here in in Berlin, and uh, have been working in this area for over 37 years. Um, so I think that um, if I were to sort of whittle it down to a couple of important things, um, the workforce you certainly mentioned in your in your introduction, um, and uh, Matt also talked about that, we, we certainly don't have enough uh, providers, um, doctors, um, advanced uh, practice uh, nurses and PAs, um, and so that certainly is one of the reasons that we have an access problem, um, both in primary care and in uh, specialty. Um, I wanna throw in one thing which um, doesn't often get mentioned, but um, being a University of Vermont Medical School alum um, and also on the admissions committee um, currently, um, I'm, I'm appalled at the the bottleneck, as, as Matt talked about, in terms of uh, Vermonters getting into the medical school. We have a very limited number of spaces that are allotted to the UVM medical students, to, sorry, to, to Vermont um, residents getting into medical school. And my understanding is that that really is a financial decision. Um, the medical school gets a lot more money from out-of-state students than they do from in-state students. But if we want to be, if we want to be getting doctors in Vermont, um, we need to be getting Vermonters into the medical school. It's very hard to recruit doctors um, to Central Vermont um, specifically because um, unless they have family here or grew up here or have some connection, um, it's, it, there's not a reason for people to come here. Um, the, the, the money can be made elsewhere. Um, there, there has to be some other, some other reason for that. And I think unless, unless the legislature can support the medical school better um, and allow more Vermonters, um, and there are many qualified Vermonters who are not getting into medical school, um, unless they can do that, then we're, we're, we're shooting ourselves in the foot in terms of, of, of workforce. Um, I think that, um, again, you mentioned the, the long waits for, for referrals, and, and that is so true from, from my standpoint as a family doc. 
um, it's it's very disheartening to tell a, a patient that they need to they need to see a specialist and then find out that it's going to be months before they can see the specialist. Um, you know, sometimes we can we can pull strings and work our magic and use our network for the local the local docs and uh, you know uh, plead and and get them get them in, but um, but that certainly doesn't work if you're talking about sending them elsewhere. We also there seems to be this wall. Um, at the New Hampshire border, we I have patients who have wanted to, uh, especially pediatric patients, um, uh, who needed to have some referrals, and uh, there was nothing available at UVM, and Dartmouth won't accept them because they're from Vermont. Um, yeah, yeah. So, uh, for instance, um, uh, a pediatric psychiatry referral, pediatric neurology referral, um, they say, no, I'm sorry, you're from Vermont, can't help you. Um, they, they sort of drew this demarcation. Um, so, so we've got a problem as far as, as, as access to, to many different things. Um, I recently, uh, there was a, a, trying to get an echocardiogram. Um, it's for Central Vermont. Um, the order was put in last week and the, the appointment is for January. Um, and that's just, you know, again, it's, it's a lack of echocardiogram, um, uh, technicians. So it's, it's not just, as you say, it's not just the doctors, it's not just the, the nurse practitioners and PAs, it's also um, other, other technicians. Um, so in terms of, again, for access, when, when I think about my practice, and, and my practice is part of um, both UVM and CVMC, and we haven't, we haven't been able to um, get enough doctors. So that's one problem. But the other thing is just the amount of time that we have to, um, to see patients. Um, when I was in practice, prior to computers coming in, I would see 20 to 25 patients a day. Mm -hmm. um, now a full, a full day is 15 patients. Um, mm -hmm. if, and, and it's hard to do that if you want to get home for dinner. Um, so there's a lot of uh, computer time that's done, you know, in, in your quote unquote free time in the evenings, the early mornings before work, on the weekends, um, and it's just leading to a lot of burnout. One thing I think that would be really, really helpful would be to have scribes. I think that would make family practice docs, primary care docs, a lot more efficient, um, and we could perhaps see more patients at least uh, not burn out as easily um, and have more time you know, at home with the family and that sort of thing. So um, I, I'm not sure I'm not sure how we get more more docs. I'm not sure how we get more nurses. The nursing shortage is is really showing up as well. Um, and I got to say, despite despite everything, our, the nurses are fantastic. They're committed. Um, they are they are wonderful. Um, we are so blessed as family practitioners in this area to have such an amazing ER. Thank you, Matt and and crew. Um, they just do an exceptional job. We have um, you know thank goodness that our CVMC has express care because when patients call up and they need acute care, uh, we're usually full and we have to actually, um, you know, send so much of our acute care to the express care. Um, and again, thank God they're there because they're doing a lot of the um, the day-to-day -day acute primary care for, um, for our patients. Um, we have, um, again, the specialists that we have are, are excellent and they're working their their tails off, um, trying to see people and, and get get stuff done, and they don't have enough um, enough help as well. Um, our hospitalist system is is fantastic. Um, it's it's wonderful to to be able to um, give our patients over our inpatients over to to that that team. So those are some of the goods and the bads, and I'll I'll stop there and let somebody else talk. Thank you very much. Could I just ask a quick follow up question? Sure. I mean, the AAMC data is pretty clear that if you take a, a state resident, train them in a state medical school, either undergraduate or, or residency, that about a third of them stay in state. If they do both undergraduate and graduate medical education, it's about two thirds stay in state. So um, just interested in following up on the comment about a, a limit or some cap on the number of Vermont residents. Do, do you know what that number is? I'm, um, 
don't quote me on it, but I'm thinking out of out of 110 or so in a class at, at UVM, I think it's on the order of 35. Okay. So it's a reasonable proportion of the class, but but still fewer than could be admitted. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. And, and I would say that, um, again, I'm a graduate of the medical school and the UVM family practice program. Mm -hmm. um, here I am. <laughs> um, and uh, had, had I trained somewhere else, I'm not sure that, you know, that would have been the case. Um, but I, I certainly think, and, and many of the medical students who want to go into family practice um, are highly sought after by our, our family practice residency program. So uh, again, it's, a, it's one of those things where if you can get them in, you can get them to stay. Right. And have you been able to get some of them to CVMC? I and mean, do they rotate with you all? Uh, yes, yes. We have we have a very strong teaching program. Uh, the the UVM students come down to um, to CVMC in in all the different specialties. It's a it's a wonderful program. Great. Thank you very much, sir. Appreciate the information and the the comments. Uh, others, much. yes, sir. Thank you. Others, please. Uh, Dr. Clark. So um, I'm actually a nurse. Um, oh. I work um, in home health, although I can't say as I'm representing my agency. Um, more I'm listening um, because I'm interested in starting an adult day program in central Vermont. And um, but I in my work, I I I hear all the things that Dr. Greenberg is saying, um, we see them as people come out of the hospital. Uh, we have incredible staffing shortages um, in home health. Uh, we see a lot of the community side of, of you know, the social determinants of health, um, the lack of resources that people have, the poverty. Um, but I, I guess I'm jumping on I'm putting my eggs in the basket of community health um, in hopes that working in the community with um, an actually an intergenerational model, which is um, being run, I know specifically being run in uh, Wisconsin. I went to a conference there recently um, where they talked about, you know, kind of how to set up an intergenerational care model. Um, using adult day and um, child care, both huge problems in Vermont um, and also how the child care part influences um, medical staff and how they graduate either in or out of working, uh, whether they can afford child care. Sometimes these are, you know, people who are not necessarily nurses or doctors, but Possibly, but also, you know, um, nurse, you know, licensed nursing assistants or PCAs, these kind of people that really um, have a large role to play in the community nursing. So that's kind of just my my take on it is um, is that I feel like a more holistic model um, that partners with the community, and also I feel like there's a there's a financing part there that's that we can't just rely on on kind of government programs that people think are there that aren't really turning out to be sufficient. And I think that we need to kind of garner the community support and say, look, we can't, we're not going to be kind of looked after by government programs anymore. These, you know, choices for care, long-term Medicaid, they're not, they don't really work. They, they pro, the program exists, but it doesn't meet the need. And so what are we going to do to meet that need for, like Dr. Greenberg said, the people who are living longer with chronic disease? So that's my. No, that's that's great. It. And just be interested in the, uh, the comment about the adult daycare and the intergenerational model. Um, you have, there are in Vermont, a lot of folks who meet the criteria for dual eligibles, that is both Medicare and Medicaid. And there are programs elsewhere that um, 
uh, you know, an agency or a group will take responsibility for a group of those folks, use those dollars to provide sort of intensive adult daycare with a pharmacist and a PT and a dietitian and transportation meals, that whole thing. Um, as I recall from not, you know, I'm from living in Massachusetts, not Vermont, but there was a program, a PACE program in Burlington that closed down a few years ago. Um, do you know anything? Is anybody trying any of those sorts of things to, to make use of that sort of continuous money? We'll get to Dr. Richter in just a minute. She may have a comment. Yeah, um, so I know there used to be a Project Independence, which was an adult day program in Barrie, um, and it was one of a few that uh, closed down during COVID. Mm. Um, there are some fairly successful adult day programs in Middlebury and Bennington Yes, um, with a lot of community support there. Um, there are some other adult day programs in uh, uh, associated with Gifford and then one in yes. Lindenville and one in Morrisville. Right. Based on my kind of observation, I went there um, to visit, uh, struggling a bit more, um, felt kind of isolated from the community. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think that's really a big player in adult day is, are they engaging in the community? Do they, right. are they essentially using the resources of volunteers of transportation yep. um you know are are people willing to engage and support their elders and right. in the case of intergenerational they're you know uh the young population right thank you very much very helpful uh dr richter Yes, hi, thank you. And I appreciate you having this these uh, listening sessions. Um, I, I I realize that some of the stuff that I'm going to say actually is up to the legislature to deal with. Um, I've been we're going to include it. That's yeah, okay. And I am a primary care doctor, actually just recently retired from primary care, but still practicing addiction medicine. Um, and um, so I, I would say, you know, we, we can't get out of this or fi fix this problem without a system. We don't have a system or we don't have a system of way of, of, um, of fixing it. If we don't have that and everyone is not included, it's, we're wasting an, an, an enormous amount of money on administration. We spend 34% of every healthcare dollar on administrative costs just to collect the money and pay for the services that we all recognize we need anyway. Um, the other pieces, most of the hospital costs, which people are talking about, are fixed. Um, and so if we keep trying to say, oh, we're going to keep people from getting care, um, well, then who is going to pay the bill? So it, without a global revenue budget, which, again, other countries have figured out, um, we're not going to fix that either. Um, we, we have too many of certain kinds of hospital beds, not enough of others. I agreed with the ER doctors in, in regards to that. Primary care, it's um, a lot of it has to do with the fact that the conditions of practice are intolerable. And um, majority of us um, remember a very different time. And, and I think Dr. Stafford was saying that how many patients you could see many years ago versus how many you can see now, a lot of that has to do with the paperwork yep. that is useless and basically just to uh, increase reimbursement. So, um, you know, I think, again, if we don't look at this as a systemic Thing where we have to include everyone, guarantee insurance coverage for um, most of care, um, we will not fix the problem. I mean, we keep trying, basically, we're doing the same thing over and over again. Um, we've been doing the same thing over for the last 50 years. So we will not get out of this without a system looking at the needs of the population and doing health planning for resources. I mean, basically for um, fixing, basically right-sizing the healthcare infrastructure because we're spending a lot of money in areas because that's where the money is generated from. That's cardiology, ophthalmology, and orthopedics. Those are better paying um, entities, whereas you don't see as many ICU beds because that's very poorly paid. So without looking at this from a systems level, which I realize a lot of that is the legislature, I don't feel that we're going to fix it. And until we have everybody in included comprehensive, publicly funded healthcare system with a budget around it and public accountability, I, I don't really see how we will fix this. 
again, I think we if we have to look at a systemic approach. I also would like to add, though, that in the 1980s, I believe it was Rochester, New York, um, actually did an experiment where the um, Healthcare Financing Administration gave them um, global revenue budgets. They included everybody. They had a lower rate of uninsured, and they lowered their um, their state health insurance costs to be 45% below the state average and 33% below the national average. It was um, in 1991, the General Accounting Office did a report about this. There's a lot of data, and, and basically they reduced the duplication of services which allowed them to have more money to spend on essential, other essential services. I think that's something that the Green Mountain Care Board really needs to seriously look at because it's already been done. It was well-documented. Um, and it, to me, is a model of, of what we could do in Vermont because this was done even with the current, um, you know, in the United States of America under our current paying, you know, the way we pay for healthcare, so. Right. No, thank you. The, the Rochester experiment is being repeated in Maryland and part of Pennsylvania and uh, is under consideration for Vermont. That's not something that my group's involved in. That's a separate effort. But uh, just uh, FYI, um, the feds have issued a uh, or will issue a request for interest for up to seven states for a global payment model for hospitals and an increased payment um, uh, for primary care uh, providers, broadly writ, including the FQHCs and rural health clinics. So is that a global that, revenue budget or a global payment for each patient? Because there's a big difference, as you it, know. Uh, no, I know, and I and I'm not. I can't speak intimately to the details. They're still looking at this, but in theory, in or in concept at least, what it would do probably based on inpatient revenue, but it would give the hospital a fixed budget for a year and 12 equal payments and a lot of technical stuff to worry about in that. But just so you know, people are thinking about things relevant to that Rochester experiment that you uh, that you referred to. But again, if the, the hospital CFOs and other people have been involved in those conversations, okay? And, and as we used to say in the Navy, that's well above my pay grade. That is the, the Green Mountain Care Board and the legislature. But thank you for your comments. Other comments and, and thoughts, please. This is very helpful to me. Please, please keep going. If you were my students, I'd start calling on you. Yes, sir, Dr. Stafford. No, that was just me clapping my hands for your comment. <laughs> I'd, I'd start calling on people. Well, you know, you know the group. Why don't you do that? You, you know them by name and what they do, and I, I don't. So Doctor, I'd, I'd appreciate your help. Dr. Haran, would you like to jump in? I think you've got some things to say. Yes, I, I do have things to say. I, I apologize. I, I can't um, show my video. Um, Okay. I have, I have um, dressed down for the evening and um, I'm not going to let you guys all see what I look like in my relaxation clothes with and chasing my dog around the kitchen. Um, I agree with most of what has been uh, been said. The example that I always, the, the, the situation that I always want to try to convey to people is that, you know, the cost of, I'm an obstetrician, gynecologist in a at central vermont where our births are going down but our acuity is going up and it is costly to have services available regardless of whether or not they are needed or actually utilized right and if they don't get utilized they don't necessarily get billed and they don't create a revenue right so so i run into not infrequently a situation where 
I need the, though that's totally fine. I've, there's variable pronunciations for my name that are, that are totally acceptable. Um, uh, I'm just, just for the record, not married or related to John Haran, the urologist. So the, I pronounced my name differently from him mainly to show that, uh, that difference. But, um, but at any rate, um, where was I? So I may have a patient who say is trying to have a trial of labor after cesarean or yeah. who I just came in yesterday with, to help out a midwife with a patient whose baby was not in a good position and was not coming down well and the cord was compressed. And in these situations, I may need to have the OR, the operating room and resources available but I'm really hoping not to use them, right? Like I'm, I'm hoping that this baby is going to come out vaginally and have a normal vaginal birth. But if there's a situation where that's unclear that that's going to happen, I need a anesthesiologist, a pediatrician, a circulating nurse for the operating room, a scrub tech. I need them already, right? right? Just in case. And that's costly. And if I don't end up using them, that's a win for the patient because she doesn't have her abdomen sliced open. But it, I've, I've called in all these people who need to be paid and no one's paying the hospital for paying them. And what's also happening, also sometimes happening is I am telling the orthopedic surgeon they can't do the case that they're gonna do for which everyone would be paid well because I need everybody to stand by because this lady whose baby is, is who's trying to birth and maybe this situation needs to play out and it might take 30 minutes or it may take four hours to try to figure it out. And in the situation that I had um, just yesterday, the, the she did de deliver vaginally and everything went well. And then the general surgeon was able to do her surgery afterwards and it all went well, but sometimes it's challenge it's more challenging than that. And sometimes I have somebody who's going to have a trial of labor after cesarean and I have her all booked because she's going to be maybe induced. And then it turns out that like, oh, well now there's an add on orthopedic case. So the kind, because of all the financial pressures, what the operating room and team will say is like, you know what, can you not induce your patient because the team that was going to be available for your patient, we now want to utilize them for an add-on orthopedic case, and that's going to make everybody more money. So I'm constantly in the situation of trying to argue for resources that I'm hoping not to need. Yeah. And, you know, it, it's challenging, right? I mean, staffing are, are, we have a low volume, but the labor floor needs to be staffed 24-7, right? And if you call off NERT, we used to have a situation where, if census was low, the nurses get called off. Well, that's not fair. You've booked your time, you've set up, you set your time and you're expecting to be paid and you're available those for that 12 hour shift, but now you're sent home and your option is you can either be unpaid or you can use CTO. Well, in the current nursing recruitment structure, in the current nursing environment, like you can get a job where you're going to get your hours. There's no reason to put up with a job where if you're a young nurse who's maybe going to have a baby and maybe wants to save your paid time off for your maternity leave, there's no reason to put up with a job where you're going to be told that you have to get, that you have to go home. Similarly, I, I mentioned in the chat that we're short on pediatricians. Well, if their pediatrician is going to take call and is paid less to take call than what they would need to charge to pay a nanny to take care of their kids, the pediatrician is not going to take call. And if the pediatrician has another, you know, breadwinner in the family, that it doesn't take long to realize this is not a sorry, Dr. Greenberg, I'm not mentioning any names. It, you know, I mean, it it doesn't, the, the math doesn't work to say I'm going to commit one in every fourth night for this parent and this family to be available on the possibility that there's a newborn that needs to be born that needs a pediatrician or a possibility that somebody comes in and hits the emergency room. So I think that ability to, to that need to staff for, um, for possibilities and to, to pay for the, not just the fee for service, but we need an infrastructure that says if, there's a certain number of baseline services that we need to have available regardless of 
whether they're needed or not. And I think there's the current fee for service infrastructure. There's no reason for everybody to stand by waiting for a healthy baby to deliver when you can make more money replacing somebody's hip. So, so that's I'll, I'll end there. All right. No, very important points and uh, right on. Got to have the infrastructure and the staff and it costs money to have that and keep them around. So thank you. Dr. Penny. Hello. Um, I couldn't find the little hand up icon. That's but okay. You waved your hand. I that worked. Um, I'm a retired um, family physician and uh, doing some volunteer work at a free clinic nearby. So keeping my hand in. Um, I want to endorse everything Dr. Richter said. I know she's been at this for many, many years. Um, we absolutely need a more rational, functional healthcare system. Um, and certainly, you know, going back a few years, give President Obama credit for the Affordable Care Act and for Vermont for expanding insurance coverage, but insurance coverage does not guarantee access, um, as we have found out. Um, you have a dysfunctional system and you increase coverage, you have a bigger dysfunctional system. You don't have a better system. Um, so we need to address that. But even if we had that, um, I have to put a plug in for the need for more primary care physicians. Mm -hmm. Even if we had um, this, this much better um, universally available um, healthcare system, we need the primary care physicians there to do the work. We do have a workforce shortage across the board, as has been mentioned many times. Um, but the biggest deficit and the one that's more rapidly increasing is in primary care physicians. And uh, there was a, a study, I forget if it was for the Green Mountain Care Board or provided by them, um, but it, it looked at the workforce changes, um, I believe it was 2018 to 2019. So before the pandemic, uh, there were at least a couple of dozen healthcare professional categories listed. The only one that had a really significant decrease was primary care physicians. Pretty much everyone else had increases, some very significant. Um, and that that's nothing significant's been done to address that. There are some scholarships to cover part of the uh, overwhelming cost of medical school and other educational uh, debt, but it really needs to be funded to come. If we want um, more primary care physicians in Vermont, we've got to make it attractive. One thing that would make it attractive would be to fully fund loan educational loan repayment, that and creating a much better practice environment, which has already been mentioned. Um, we want to we're competing with the rest of the country. This is a nationwide shortage, as I'm sure you know. Um, if we can make a more attractive practice environment, and again, not to belabor the many um, problems we've had with prior authorization, EMRs, et cetera, et cetera. So those are the things that really need to be addressed and need to be addressed really soon. They should have been addressed decades ago because it's been growing since then. So. No, thank you. There you know, are. a lot of med medical schools started in the late 60s and early 70s to try to fix this, and it didn't happen. So thank you. Points points noted. Uh, Jeremiah. Hi, good evening. Can you hear me okay, Bruce? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, so I agree with... Uh, most of the comments that have been made, and I really appreciate um, comments from my colleagues, uh, Dr. Greenberg and uh, Dr. Stafford. I'm a primary care physician, a family medicine physician in central Vermont. I have been practicing here for uh, 15 years. And prior to that, I was five years in Colorado. Mm -hmm. I actually grew up in Pennsylvania, went to medical school in Pennsylvania. Wow. And um, I went to, it was Hahnemann, now it's Drexel. Oh yeah, University. It's where my yeah. where my dad went. Oh okay, um, and then I did my residency training in West Virginia and ended up in Colorado for five years. Um, I just want to share kind of my experience with primary care and how it's evolved over the last fifteen years in Central Vermont to sort of give a picture of I think where we are right now. Um, so when I first moved here, it was um, 
a practice that was owned by the hospital. We had um, five, I think, or maybe six primary care family medicine uh, nurse practitioners, physicians, and I worked full time. I saw patients um, a full time schedule, and I saw probably eighteen, maybe twenty patients in a day. Uh, then we adopted the electronic health record, and as as we all know, that slowed things down, reduced efficiency. Um, and so, I, I, you know, I was fortunate enough to work with a, a group of administrators who were willing to try scribes. And so to Dr. Stafford's point, you know, I worked with scribes for about five or six years. And I remember my wife uh, exclaiming one evening, why are you home so early? <laughs> um, and because, uh, you know, it, it sort of, it sort of brought back a part of my life that I didn't have for, for quite a while, um, being able to be home in the evenings with my family. So it was a tremendous, um, tremendous thing that happened to, to use scribes. And um, it did change the patient relationship, which I think, um, I think we all understand that, that the patient relationship changes when there's another person in the room. Um, but the, the benefits were great. And unfortunately, the scribe program didn't last. Um, it was financially feasible if you saw enough patients, but most of my colleagues weren't really able to keep up that pace and and we just ended up abandoning when the pandemic hit um a lot of things went away and that was one of the things that went away so we haven't had any scribes since then we then went on to epic which is a um, i think a better electronic health record system than we had before and i have seen some of the in, some of the benefits of being on electronic health record where there's a lot of tracking of data so i work in quality as well and um half of my, not half of my time, about a third of my time is spent doing quality improvement work. And there's a tremendous amount of data that we can acquire and we can improve the quality of the care that we provide patients that way. So I understand the need for the, the administrative burden and the documentation and um, collecting all that data is really important. But on the other hand, I also see my colleagues, my, the people that I work with very closely and I watch them burning out. Um, when I first started, as I mentioned, we had full-time providers. Everyone worked full-time. Now in my practice, we have eight primary care people and nobody works full-time. Um, they work on average half-time. So uh, the, the, it's just in primary care and family medicine, you know, that everyone is so burned out that nobody feels that they can work full-time anymore. Um, so I think that that's a big piece of what we need to solve. and. Um, I think that in our health network, we're certainly working on that and we're trying to transform primary care so that it is more enjoyable and more doable, but there's a tremendous amount of investment that needs to happen. So yeah. I echo what Dr. Penny said and Dr. Stafford and everyone said about investing in primary care. And I just implore, implore you to, um, to focus on that. Well, we'll be, Thank you. we'll be, we'll be pushing it. I just want to ask you a question. I, we installed Epic at Geisinger in 1997. We were the second install in the US. And we spent a huge amount of time. This is, you know, Epic's done a lot since, but we spent a huge amount of time tailoring it to the needs of the individual specialist, including the primary care folks as specialists in their own right, pick lists, all that stuff, automatic documentation. Um, and one of the things that occurred a little later was that some of our folk figured out you could actually have the patient enter most of that information. And, you know, we looked at, uh, for example, a rheumatology practice, and they spent, oh, this is 15 years ago now, they spent 15 minutes getting ready for the interview, you know, for the patient thing with the lab and the drugs and trying to figure all that out and asking the, the patient a lot of questions about joint stiffness and all that. And we could get that fixed so that the doc could spend his 15 minutes or whatever it was with the patient talking to the patient about what to do next, not about asking 20 questions and, and that kind of stuff. Is, is your health system working toward that or you still trying to figure out how to get people to use Epic? Um, 
I would say that we're in various stages of adoption because the University of Vermont Medical Center has been on Epic for, I don't know, 15 years. Maybe Dr. Stafford could probably tell you tell us. Um, okay. But but we we recently went on to Epic just a few years ago at Central Vermont, and the rest of the network, the organizations have more recently gone on to Epic. So um, we benef we benefited greatly, I think, from the historical work that had been done with Epic at the at the medical center. Um, but I would say that we are probably not as advanced as we could be in terms of patient-entered data. Um, we have a portal system that the patients can access. And um, so just recently, I discovered that I can have patients put their blood pressure readings into the portal, for example. So that's yeah. great. Um, but uh, but I, think that, I think to answer your question, I think there's probably a lot more that we could do. Okay. Thank you very much. Very, very helpful. Um, hopefully, if I when I get up there and can look you guys in the eye, we can have a little more conversation about this. I've, you know, traveled around the U.S. and around the world doing some of this stuff, and it's interesting that, you know, I've I've seen people who use, for example, their MA. They spend some time training them, but they can get a lot done for them. And I guess one of the questions, you know, I I just have for the group. I've been given to understand that the state pharmacy board has recently made it a little more difficult for your uh, office staff to refill prescriptions. So uh, if somebody wants to comment on that at some time, Dr. Stafford, please. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Jeremiah. Um, I, I wanted to, well, first of all, the um, 2011 was when um, uh, UVM went over to, to Epic um, and in that we were one of the um, the UVM outpatient um, offices. That's when we went over and CVMC came in um, some years later. Um, so I, I think, I think Epic is a, is an amazing tool um, as Jeremiah says, I mean, there's so much information there that can be accessed. Whereas before you were leafing through, you know, pages and pages and pages trying to find that x-ray report. Um, so it's really in, in many ways, it, it's made finding information and sharing information much more efficient. Um, but, uh, but there's an awful lot of um, redundancy and a lot of checking of boxes and things like that, that really, um, really are time consuming and not, and not particularly helpful. I don't, you know, really care about a lot of the stuff that, that we're asked to, to do. Um, but one of the other things that's, that's happened is in, in um, with the, the patient portal um, called my chart here um, it allows it allows the patient to you know message you directly and and vice versa which um, can be a fantastic thing but in that patients are no longer able to get into the office to see their doctors they're sending lots of lots of messages and so all during the day and at the end of the day we've just got a pile of, of work to do that has to do with patient communication um, to say nothing about all of the uh, uh, refills of prescriptions and, and yeah. Yeah. whatever. And so, and so there's, but there's no carve out during the day to do this, this work, which then of course ends up being on my time. Um, you know, we're, we're asked to, you know, put patients through and um, spend the time, you know, making the money um, in, in the offices and all of that rest of the stuff is on our time. So, it's um, that's what adds to burnout um, is is the way that the system is set up, and again, I you know I talk a lot about the our office because we are part of the hospital system, and so whatever happens within um, you know within our offices also has to do with the hospital and whatever we're wishing for in terms of of resources got to come out of their budget. Um, so um, you know sometimes I I feel like the Green Care Board may not be as in tuned with um, what happens in the offices of the primary care doctors and, and how that relates to hospital budgets, but but that's got to be a huge drain on, on the hospitals. Um, it's not just about inpatients and and uh, you know what happens on the hospital grounds. So um, that's right. what I wanted to add. Right. No, and that's a, I think that's a very important point. Thank you, because I think the my sense is the focus has been really sort of inpatient and ambulatory hospital stuff, but not really thinking about the associated physicians practices. So yes, uh, we'll, 
we'll, we'll keep that in mind. Been thinking about it, but you've brought it to the fore. Thank you. You're welcome. Other uh, thoughts or, as I would say to my students, screams of outrage? Dr. Chase? Oh, you're still on mute, sir. There you Hi go. there, yeah. Uh, my name is Derek Chase. Uh, I actually grew up in Calais, Vermont, which is about 10 miles from CVMC. I went to high school at U32, which is like four miles. And when I was eight, uh, I fell off a swing set, broke my arm, had surgery at CVMC. And uh, that's why I became an orthopedic surgeon. Um, and I am a uh, UVM class of 2008 uh, alumni. And I'm suspicious that Dr. Stafford even uh, mm -hmm. interviewed me. I'm not, mm -hmm. not quite sure. Um, I was also a Freeman Foundation scholar, and I accepted a scholarship uh, for a commitment to come back to Vermont after residency to practice. Mm -hmm. And I did my residency and training in, in California, and I honored my promise and came back. And um, I have privileges at Gifford, uh, and I provided services um, at, uh, in Berlin mm -hmm. uh, for a while. Um, and I've moved on to uh, becoming an independent contractor, and I contract with a hospital um, uh, in New Hampshire. And uh, by contracting with me directly, instead of going through a locums company, I save them about $2,000 a day, $40,000 a month, or half a million dollars a year. Um, and you know, we hear administrators over and over again about complaining about locums and, and travelers, and I think it's an avoidable cost. Um, and I, I really would like to thank you and the Green Mountain Care Board uh, for really tackling this critical issue. Um, I think uh, cost is incredibly important, and I think it is out of hand. I think Chairman Foster, you know, he said that, um, you know, the the increase in healthcare is about 15% a year and Vermont uh, income is two to 4% a year and it's just not sustainable. And I think there's a lot we can do to reduce costs. And I think we just have to look at it. And I think also the people who can have the greatest impact on reducing costs are physicians and providers. And I'll, I was an economics major um, and I grew up a, a thrifty frugal Yankee um, but the, the cost in the hospital is insane. Um, you know, it, it's unlike any other industry uh, where you buy um, goods and services and you have no idea how much it costs. Um, I'd always joke in the OR, there should be barcodes on everything. And anytime a nurse opens something, they should scan it and it should ring up a tally on the top of the, uh, so everyone can see what they're spending. And you know, the, I think the Green Mountain Care Board has done a great job looking at costs, but I don't think it's good enough. Um, you know, for example, we look at the cost of uh, inpatient admission or discharge, and, and we look at hospitals on that one metric. And of course, hospitals are going to, you know, decrease their costs to, you know, not raise any suspicion and keep that reasonable. But then if you look at other costs, like outpatient surgeries, there's such a huge range. So like at Gifford, it costs $60,000 for a knee replacement, where at, um, you know, Copley, another critical access hospital costs 30. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you're doing 65 knee replacements and you're doing it each knee replacement, $30,000 more than your neighbor, that's an extra $2 million a year in costs. And, you know, administrators, they don't even ask us to reduce costs. We're not at all incentivized to reduce cost. Um, or same thing with quality, where we're all paid a median, supposedly a median salary, and we all probably have some kind of productivity incentive bonus, but we have no cost incentive, we have no real quality incentive. Um, so I think those are, are big issues, and um, I don't think anything's going to be a, a quick fix, but I think, you know, we got to look um, a decade out or, or something and, and see what... Um, you know, we want our healthcare system to be like then. Um, so uh, that's just some some of my input. The other input I had um, to, to follow up on Dr. Corian's uh, comment about on-call OR staff availability. Mm -hmm. Orthopedic surgeons don't mind 
if you bump us, we understand babies and mothers come first. We can fix our, our fractures with, when um, time allows. But I think it would be helpful if healthcare systems reduce costs, um, they could provide more staff and more access. And I think that would be a beneficial thing to do. I also am a big fan of scribes. Um, but one thing that's coming in the pipeline, and I, I work at, um, at a hospital that's part of the main health system, and they have this program of AI. So not actual physical people scribes, but AI, um, you know, doing your credit cards, <laughs> like, you know, hey, Alexa, do a level three uh, uh, new patient encounter. Right. And they would listen to it and they type most of it in. So I think embracing technology like that, um, same with, you know, radiology, getting AI to read radiology or, or x-rays or films, um, you know, might be a cost saving. So just some ideas. All right. Well, and certainly there are dictation systems that would yeah. input directly into Epic as well. But thank you. I guess a quick question for you. I mean, your your point about directly contracting with the physician rather than going through a locums agency or some sort of general agency is certainly a one way of reducing the cost of of acquiring a, the physician's services. Um, is there a way to, to generalize that? I mean, certainly the, the locums agency is sort of like, a oh, you know, I don't know, a, 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 a search firm in a sense, and that they have a, a group of people that you can call and get and they have a fee for that. Yeah. But w what other way to do that would you think about? Well, if you look at, if you um, listen to some, I think CVMC's uh, budget um, uh, hearing, as well as North County budgets hearing, yep. um, I think North County said locums charge up, up to 200%. Yep. Um, and I think uh, <laughs> a couple of people at CVMC said 60 to 100% above the cost of um, uh, an employed or directly contracted physician. Uh, so, I mean, those companies have to make money and, and they, yeah. they, uh, they have to make a profit and they're a little bit like leeches. They don't do a lot. They just, they're kind of a, a middleman that yeah. they're kind of opportunists is, is really what I think sure. they are. So, um, and I'll, I'll tell you with CVMC, my own experiences, um, you know, I applied on their website and I didn't hear back for three or four weeks. I called everybody, I and emailed everybody. Um, mm -hmm. No one replied, uh, still waiting to hear. Um, and I found out they only have for the entire UVM health network, they only have two recruiters and they're oh. brand new and they're each um, two recruiters for, for, for Vermont. They have a third recruiter for their New York hospitals, but each of them were handling 200 applications um and then they were they were new they were overwhelmed and you know you hear on the green mountain care boards um public hearings which are which are awesome but you hear over and over again administrators complaining about recruitment costs and retention costs and locums costs and travelers costs but i don't see them making an effort to mitigate those costs so just my two cents there no, i don't know no, if that gets your question I hope it did. No, no, it it does. And I, I appreciate the information. I mean, this is the sort of thing I'm after, right? I mean, this, you know, there, there are some of these things that can be fixed by the appropriate people. I, I'm not sure Green Mountain Board is the group to fix that. But, you know, having, I've had to, Geisinger, if you don't know it, is a 400 bed level one trauma liver transplant hospital in a town of 5,000 people in the mountains. Huh. So I've had to recruit. I used to know where the nearest Korean Presbyterian church was, <laughs> just as an, as an illustration of if you want to recruit doctors to small towns. And so the things you're mentioning are, are very important mm -hmm. in terms of the detail. And I, I'm sort of hoping that one of the things my team and I are are bringing to this is a bit more of an eye on the clinical needs and what the infrastructure is and 
you know, that you can't just make, you know, move something from here to there because you got an extra 20 patient days or something. So, so I really appreciate those comments. Thank you. Dr. Haram. I'll just say the other, to, to the point of, um, you know, the cost of locums agencies for physicians and traveler agencies for nurses is it's really, you have to invest in retention. And you have to listen to people when they say they're burning out. And when the nurses say, this is not sustainable because I'm getting called off of my shifts some weeks and being asked to work overtime other weeks, that's not sustainable. Right. You don't say ignore, ignore, ignore until they leave. And then you have to pay travelers. And when the pediatricians say it's not sustainable to be taking all this call because I could make, I can't afford daycare for my family and I could get the same job somewhere else that's near a tertiary care center where I could do outpatient pediatrics and not take call. Yep. You don't just dismiss them. You listen and say, hmm, something's a problem here. Otherwise everybody leaves. Like so so you can no no one's just like walking away. There's still nurse labor, labor trained nurses in the central Vermont area that are not working working at CVMC and we're hiring travelers. There's still competent pediatricians that live in central Vermont that are not working at CVMC. And I don't know what we're gonna do when, the, when we get to the, to the end of the, the pipeline with them, but like, it's not, you, it's, we're, we're investing, we're having to pay the, like, I think part of it is this like being penny wise and pound foolish business, right? Like we're, and everyone's worried about the cost just for their particular cost center for their particular budget year and not the overall cost. So that's what I have to say about that. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Fisher. Good evening. <clears throat> Good evening, everyone. Mike Fisher, um, healthcare advocate. I, I guess I kind of wanted to jump in a little bit in response to Dr. Chase. I kind of had a question response, but maybe it's to anybody. Um, <clears throat> I kind of get it. Why we don't say to doctors, hey, be concerned about cost. Hey, you should be saving money. I kind of get it that we want doctors to focus on doing the job and doing it well. And so I'm intrigued by that, by Dr. Chase's comment. You know, nobody's asking, you know, doctors to be concerned about cost. Um, and I kind of wonder how, you know, from your vantage points, providers, how would you, how do you balance that? Tension. So, Dr. Haran had her hand up first, I think, and then Dr. Chase. Thank you. That's an old hand. You can go to Dr. Chase on that. Okay, Dr. Chase. Sorry, you're on mute, sir. So, I, I totally understand and I, I totally agree. Um, there, there's a great article in June in the New York Times, I think it's called The Moral Crisis of American Doctors. And it speaks of this kind of hot topic called moral injury, mm -hmm. um, which is a huge contributor to burnout. And part of that is, you know, physicians really being handcuffed to not provide, um, you know, the optimal care we want to provide. And that can be because of administrators or health insurance or lots of reasons for, for this burnout. But um, I think it's the I think it's June 15th in the New York Times. It's a great article. Um, and I would, I would respect that. But in terms of cost, so, so I do uh, shoulder replacements. I do hip replacements. I do knee replacements. Um, uh, this one hospital, so I first worked at Northwestern, and I just used the implant that my partner was using um, uh, because he had already been using it. It's called a, a Lima, and it's from Italy. Um, and then I, I moved to Gifford like uh, seven years ago and brought the rep and was interested to use it there. And I found out that implant cost $18,000 um, where like a Depew, which is a Johnson & Johnson company, that implant costs $7,000. And this company, Lima, they're offering to fly me to Italy for, for training. I didn't go. <laughs> I didn't do anything. I don't have, I don't have any royalties or consulting fees from any industry. Um, but but that's an example of like an easy way to reduce um, cost. And 
um, it doesn't, uh, you know, sacrifice patient care. I don't want to pigeonhole physicians and, and my colleagues to, um, you know, not use stuff that they know delivers good outcomes and good patient care. You know, I, I do think everyone should have this choice a little bit, but I think we need to be aware of of the cost of of the healthcare we provide, and and that's my big thing is I just don't think physicians are aware of the costs they provide. I mean, you know, hospital charges should be, you know, I think it's CMS mandated. And I think it, there's a, another Vermont statute that mandates that hospitals list the prices of their services on the websites. Most hospitals do, some don't. Um, uh, and I, I just don't think doctors look at that. And I think even if we did want to reduce the cost, I think there's a lot of administrative barriers to to actually doing that. It, I think there's a lack of transparency in hospitals actually allowing us to see the itemized cost of the services we provide. It's my opinion, but uh, but I do agree. Um, it is a, a balanced thing, and I don't want to. Um, I, I think it does create moral injury by handcuffing physicians and the medications they can prescribe, the referrals they can send, the implants they can use. I think there should be some broad leeway, but I don't think you should, it's my personal opinion, but I don't think you should be using implants that are twice the cost from a company in Italy that's willing to fly you there. So. Thank you, um, that's yeah. great points. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Richter. Uh, well, yeah, I, I think we should also distinguish between charges and costs because we know that due to the charge master, sometimes you know one hospital may charge sixty thousand for a hip replacement and another charge thirty thousand, whereas that hospital that charges thirty thousand may charge sixty thousand for something else, and it really just comes to how can we get the the money to pay our fixed costs. So that again, this is cr crying out for a healthcare system and a global revenue budget. I don't think physicians or patients are in the position to be able to determine um, when they're in the middle of treating patients, um, you know, what, what is going to be more expensive or less expensive. I think roughly we can, you know, we know roughly, but, but I prescribe hundreds and hundreds of drugs. And uh, for me to know each one, that's what the whole purpose of a formulary is and why every other industrialized country has a formulary that they, they vet what is the cheapest one out of you know a class of drugs, for example? Um, the other thing is, is if we want to save money, um, there's no better way than to have everyone have access to a primary care. And again, I know we've said this a bunch of times, but that is the only thing that has been shown, the only sector to improve population health, lower costs, and improve quality. And yet we really are doing, it seems that in the Vermont, we're doing everything to discourage um, primary care. Uh, we knew five years ago that most of us were retiring. And, you know, so I think, again, if we want to do something about it, the other point, um, and again, I think maybe some of this has got to be done at the national level. If we fully funded medical education for those who agreed to go into primary care, we probably could get more primary care, people going into primary care. But we also have to improve the conditions of practice. But the other point is when you're talking about costs and charges, um, it's really difficult to do that because we have to know what 80% of the population uses 20% of the care and 20% use 80%. So those patients are really, really expensive anyway. So once someone in this is in the ICU, they're the ones generating most of the cost in the system itself. And I think it's really hard. Maybe as an orthopedic surgeon, you can choose a cheaper um, implant or whatever, but I, I prosthesis, I, I don't think that's that, you know, as system-wide that that's really the way to go. Thank you. Well, well, I could just say just for that for the knee replacement example, just at, at my hospital, by reducing the cost um, to you know what Copley or other critical hospitals do, that that would be roughly two million dollars a year, which would be roughly four percent of our uh, net patient revenue yeah. and six percent of payment. So that's just one procedure. And, and you know, the other thing I've been thinking about is this this cost cost shifting, how we you know, charge commercial payers more to subsidize Medicare, Medicaid, uh, you know, bad debt, that kind of thing. But another way we kind of cost sh shift is with these procedures. We, you know, like you said, Dr. Horn, the orthopedic surgeon gets paid a lot. So we charge a lot because we can to subsidize, um, you know, primary care. And I agree with you 100%. 
Um, you know, uh, most of Vermont needs critical access and we need critical access to primary care, preventative care, mental health, and we need critical access to ER care and em emergency things. Um, I, so I grew up in Vermont. My, my kind of joke is I think Vermont healthcare should be like Cabot cheddar cheese. It's affordable, it's quality, and you can find it everywhere. And you can find regular Cabot cheddar cheese everywhere, every little town. But if you want like smoked habanero Cabot cheddar cheese, yeah, you got to go to Cabot or you got to go to one of their, their factory stores. But Vermont healthcare, we should be able to have quality, you know, critical access to the basic services. And absolutely, UVM is a, a great asset. Um, even CVMC is a great asset. Lots of patients from these critical critical access hospitals get get transferred there. Um, but but look, big big picture, I, I do agree with you about primary care, preventative care, uh, everything you said, burnout. Um, you know, or staff availability on the weekends. Um, it, it all makes sense. Let me just uh, note, there are some simple things. We did a, my uh, uh, cardiac surgeons and the, actually the orthopedists at uh, Geisinger standardized the instrument sets used for surgery because the surgeons often have different gadgets that they want for various reasons. But when they standardized those instrument sets, it simplified the central sterile supply and reprocessing thing. And actually with that damaged instrument stuff that was open but never used had to be re-sterilized, we saved about $2,000 a case. Yeah. Okay, so there are some operational, you know, not trivial stuff because it's not easy to get surgeons to agree to give up their special professor's gizmo. Yeah. But I, there are ways to do it. Right. Yep. Okay. I, I agree Dr. with all of that. Yeah. Sorry. Dr. Greenberg. Yeah, I was just going to say cost transparency is huge. Um, I agree with everything that's been said before, but it also does come with a little bit of a moral dilemma. Um, so one of my colleagues jokes with the medical students we see all the time that one of the most expensive things in the hospital is an ER physician, a mouse, and a middle finger, or a, a pointer finger. Because in a matter of one minute, I can order $10,000 worth in tests. And some patients need that, but some don't. Um, and, you know, I have a rough estimate of what some things cost, but most things I have no idea. I'll be honest, I have no idea what a CBC costs. There's been some talk that maybe we should know what each of these things costs. What I do know is that an ER visit is very expensive. And sometimes if I notice on a chart that someone is self-pay, I don't know. Does it change my management? I hope not, but I see that there. And, you know, I see someone who comes in, a 40-year-old, uh, a 35-year-old guy who's got some chest pain. I don't think this is a heart attack, but it could be. And, you know, if I go through and I order all that lab work that we would normally do for a chest pain workup, and then uh, maybe I start thinking about, oh, could he have a PE? And he came in a little tachycardic. It's probably just anxiety, but he falls out of my perk and my well score. So I add a D dimer and that came back positive. And then I get a CT angiogram and oh, good, it's normal. Everything came back normal. I think you pulled your muscle. I just gave that guy a $10,000 bill. And he might go, you know, that weighs on me. And that's a tough decision. But then I've seen PEs and guys just like that who've had, you know, cardiac damage and uh -huh. I don't want to miss that. So I think we try very hard to balance out risk and cost. Mm -hmm. And I think we could do a better job of that. You know, we use scoring systems. We use things. We've tried to adopt good scoring systems like Perkin Wells. We've tried to find ways of, of making reasonable decisions. One example that I'm, I think is a great decision was previously for about the first 10 years I worked here, every hospitalization to the psychiatric department and usually even before hospitalization, just to be seen by a psychiatrist to quote unquote medically clear a person to say that they don't have a medical ailment causing their clearly psychiatric illness. Yep. It would involve a lab barrage that would include a CBC, a comprehensive medic product panel, <laughs> a TSH and a drug screen. 
and an mm -hmm. alcohol level. Um, now, it doesn't matter that this person might have been here two days ago and had all those tests done. So we needed to start thinking about this reasonably. And in most young people, we don't need to do these things. You know, a drug screen, I don't care if they smoked marijuana. It doesn't matter for their diagnosis. Um, maybe it does matter if they're using meth and cocaine and they have symptoms of that. But if they don't have symptoms of that, it's probably not necessary. And that drug screen, which is not very accurate, it's neither sensitive nor specific, um, costs somewhere on the order of $500 to $700. So why do we keep ordering these tests that are not used clinically? And I think that's the cost transparency, at least at my level. And I think every level, every department, every sort of individual clinic has a certain degree of cost cutting that can be done within reason. But that being said, healthcare is outrageously expensive. And if we don't want to miss things and we don't want people dying on our shift, there's a certain amount of risk and that we can't avoid and a certain amount of cost that we we just need to order. And and knowing someone's insurance status or or their ability to pay can put a lot of pressure on a physician. So to answer whoever asked that question, um, it's a really tough thing to know about, you know, someone's insurance status when you're trying to work them up. Generally, honestly, I try not to look because I don't want it affecting my medical judgment. Um, but there are other ways that cost transparency can be utilized and be very effective at reducing cost. Dr. Haran? I, I completely agree with what Dr. Greenberg is saying in terms in terms of cost. And certainly there's been studies, right? Like that cost transparency or cost sharing for the patient that like it does decrease cost, but it decreases cost of both unneeded and needed services, right? So like you um, but the, but I just wanted to echo that because I, I I agree with with everything Matt said on that. But my, the reason I originally raised my hand was back in terms of discussion of primary care providers and investing in primary care. And the fact that relationships really matter, like pa people, patients value their relationships with their primary care provider and primary care providers value their relationships with patients. And if you have time for patients to be able to access their primary care provider and sit down and review the chart and take the history and somebody who really knows you, that, that saves a lot of money and has better outcomes and all, all, the, all the things that I can't necessarily quote. But, you know, I, I bridge a little bit as, a, as an OBGYN, I bridge primary care and specialty, right? Because a lot of women identify their OBGYN as a primary care provider, right? But I don't know all the, I don't, know how to treat high cholesterol and high blood pressure. And I, I didn't go into internal medicine because there were too many antihypertensives for my, for my brain to keep, keep track. And I was just like, okay, I'm not, I'm not going to do all that. Um, I can keep track of the birth control pills that I can do, but I can't keep track of all the, the lipid drugs and all that. But, you know, the, the, to the point about the retiring PCPs, like, you know, Dr. Stafford, um, Dr. Vassar, Dr. Kellogg, like, all these patients who see those PCPs, they also see me and my, myself and my colleagues for their OBGYN care. And I see these women and they come in and they say, can you be my primary care? Like, you're the only one who knows me. You're the only one who, who examines me. Like my primary retired that knew me for 20 years. And now it's just a name on a, on the chart of who I got assigned to. And that person has, by the way, rotated three different times because people keep leaving and maybe it's a maybe it's a PA or a nurse practitioner who's going to provide phenomenal care but maybe it's a PA or a nurse practitioner who's fresh out of school and doesn't necessarily have the training and expertise to to evaluate so so I think that one of the things as the system kind of gets gets a little unwieldy and as we hire into this network and we're just kind of like acting like we're treating widgets is I think we're losing that that people both on the side of the what what motivates someone to go into primary care even though they don't get paid what the orthopedic surgeons get paid and what motivates a patient to maintain a 
relationship with their PCP is those relationships. And the more we put things in the way between the, between the PCP and the patient, the more we drive people into the emergency room and into, the, into those other um, places that are higher cost care because they can't access someone who just knows them well and oh. understands that maybe they did strain a muscle and maybe they had a PE, but somebody who, you know, and I think that we're, we're losing that, so. Thank you. Dr. Chase? Yeah, I, I completely agree with Dr. Horan's points as well. And, and I think that really speaks to continuity of care, um, which I think not only adds a lot to patient satisfaction, but I don't know if you've seen this, the Department of Health serious reportable events. And you see how much that has gone up. Uh, like it used to be like less than 50 a year in the state. And now it's almost triple. And part of the reason that is, is turnover. And so I, I think that goes along with what everyone's been talking about is, um, you know, quality, which is what, one of the most important things is turnover also it decreases patient satisfaction and uh, it decreases quality. Um, and then to Dr. Greenberg's point, the, the ER is a little bit different. I, I don't want, um, I think for sure, uh, you know, emergent care, life-threatening care, I don't think cost should be up there. But for elective procedures, like like joint replacements and, and for things that can be scheduled out, um, I think you could have some um, more analysis of, of the cost of the services you're providing. And, and I also wanna make clear when I, when I do discuss costs, I don't want any administrator ever telling me I can't use something um, or I can't prescribe something that I know is the best thing for the patient. Um, so a little bit of a double-edged sword, but um, I think it's just something to, to bring up in discussion. And, and I also, th I don't think in incentivizing physicians to reduce cost, I think it should definitely be a, a carrot and not a stick. Um, and I, you know, I think, I think some, I don't know how that's going to work. Um, but I, I do think uh, since we are responsible for, um, I mean, we really oversee all the care in the state. We're, we're the ones that diagnose the patient. We're the ones that order tests uh, and treat patients. And so we set that line of treatment. Um, so I think somehow to make us more accountable and able to affect costs would be beneficial. Yeah. Thank you. Well, you know, it sounds to me, <clears throat> I think it was Dr. Richter that pointed, or perhaps you, Dr. Chase, that pointed out that was the purpose of a formulary, right? Was to get the yeah. docs together to look at the data and what does the job and is reasonably affordable and and those sorts of things. And I, I expect that's the emergency room crews done the same thing with how to deal with back pain and headaches and what gets a CT and what doesn't. So uh, there are efforts being made in that. I, to me, a, a big part of this is for the scheduled things, you know, cause you, you know, if you got a broken arm or, you know, blacked out, you're not gonna get carried to the hospital and worry much about what it costs. But for anything that you schedule or that you have time to prepare for, then um, you should be able to figure out or find out what it's what it's likely to cost you. Um, I, I think you know it's a difficult area. I had a was did a visiting professorship in Toledo a while back, and the cab driver I was asking about this told me that he had got he uh, well exactly Cleveland. He he lived near the Cleveland Clinic. He got his heart surgery at Mass General Hospital. And I asked him why, and he said, because Medicare paid the same rate. It didn't cost me anything either way. So multifactorial problem. Mr. Fisher, you always ask good questions. You need, and you have an expert group here in, in my colleagues who are gathered. What other questions do you want to ask them? Can 
Hmm. That's you putting me on the spot. That's that's sure. good. good. I'm glad you're here. <clears throat> you know, I um so for those who don't know, um, I'm the healthcare advocate and and uh and we run a helpline. Vermonters call us every day, uh trying to solve some kind of access to care problems. Often it's eligibility for a, a um you know a state or a federal program. Um <clears throat> but um and often it's a problem in the, you know, the bureaucracies, something's amiss, something's not working for them. Um, <clears throat> but I think the question, so we hear the consumer side of the equation all the time. We hear a lot from people who don't know how they're going to follow their, their provider's advice and afford it. We sit in that space a lot. Um, I guess I wonder how providers deal with that. Um, what does it look like to you when you have a client, a patient who um, who can't afford it, or maybe you don't know whether they can afford it, um, struggling to follow your advice? <clears throat> how, how do you how do you deal with that, Dr. Chase? Yeah, I mean, so if a patient is cash payer out of pocket. I'll I'll go look at um, let's see if I can find it. But for the Vermont uh, Department of Health has hospital uh, report cards, and part of that is they should have um, costs for services there, and they should be listed by each hospital. And so if someone wants like a, a MRI and they're out of pocket, I'll refer patients to that website and tell them I'm happy to. Um, prescribe this MRI anywhere you, you want to have it done. And there's a huge difference. I mean, a patient can save um, thousands of dollars by, you know, driving uh, 30 or 40 miles to, to have an MRI somewhere else. So um, that, that's one way I would do it. The other thing is not all hospitals um, routinely collect patient satisfaction scores and comments. Um, there's some mandated CMS thing, but oftentimes at least the at least one hospital I'm familiar with doesn't collect any patient satisfaction on on individual providers. So um, you know that's also feedback that would be very helpful to have. Thank you, Dr. Richter. Yeah, can I can I add to the question before Deb goes? Sure. Um, are are you are are providers aware of their hospitals' free and reduced care? standards uh, you know are, are you aware of what cvmc for instance covers at different incomes and is that factor into any of your decisions sorry deb keep going oh please well i was going to answer just the question about um patients affording things mm -hmm. i mean it's always good rx that's that coupon where they can get cheaper medications um, again, there are, you know, some of the newer meds that that's, that doesn't save them very much, right. but quite honestly, I encourage people, um, if they can to work off the books and, uh, they'll be eligible for Medicaid. Um, I have a lot of, I, that's, it's illegal and it's sometimes, but I look at it as, um, if, if that's how a patient is going to be able to get the, the care they need, um, I encourage them. I've encouraged people to get married. I've encouraged people to get divorced. Um, it's insane, but if to me, I consider what I do as a physician to be the, the you know, and for this person's health, that is my um, Hippocratic oath. Um, so if that gets them better insurance coverage, I have done that. I think it's absolutely insane that I'm giving marital advice based on health insurance. But um, those are some of the things that I do, because other than that, what else can you do? Generic drugs, of course, you know, if if they're appropriate. Um, but um, other than that, I, I'm, you know, I don't see this problem getting any better and, until we fix it systemically. So, yeah, Dr. Chase. Yeah, just one more follow up to to Mr. Fisher's uh, question. Is the other thing if a if I have a uninsured patient who just broke something and they're really stressed about um, insurance and costs most all hospitals have someone in billing or some kind of patient representative. And I'll, I'll, uh, I don't know that person personally, but I'll get their card and I'll give it to the patient to contact. And I kind of wash my hands at, uh, of it 
from there. But that's what I do is if there's usually someone at every hospital, some kind of patient representative or billing who can go over those details with, with patients. Yeah. A, a financial assistance person yeah. that can walk them through the reduction in payments or forgiveness or whatever. Okay. Other questions, comments? We're in danger of giving you time off to go get a nightcap. Okay. Uh, let's go to the last slide, Gretchel. This is just going to show you where to send excuse comments. Me, excuse me, Bruce. Matt, yeah, Matt please, had, go ahead. Matt had his hand up. Matt, excuse me. I've heard other people call you Matt, so I'm calling you Matt. That, that's fine. Sorry, I was just going to add one comment. It's not that. Um, the uh, the Medicaid observation rules are horribly painful, and that is probably the biggest the biggest financial interactions I wind up having with families is when I go to admit a patient and they want to know, is this an observation admission or is this a true admission? And if I say often that decision in general, that decision is not up to me. And I always defer it to the hospitalist because the hospitalist is making that call. Sometimes I know I'm like, you know, honestly, you're only going to be here one night. It's going to be an observation. And then they refuse to stay. Um, this is a huge, huge, huge problem. Um, mm -hmm. It's completely unfair. It's arbitrary. It makes no sense. Why should we be incentivizing more time in the hospital than someone truly needs? Yeah. Um, it's it's ridiculous. Um, that would be amazing if somebody could fix that problem. I'll just throw that out there. So that's that's one of those cost interactions that I run into that I have to deal with. And I agree with Dr. Chase. There's always somebody at the hospital you can affirm to patient financial services, although they're only there Monday through Friday, you know, eight to nine to five or whatever. Um, so um, yeah, but that that observation status thing is one thing that just really gets in the way a lot. And people are really upset about that. Thank you very much. Any other comments or Okay. Okay, Gretchen, let's go to the last slide. This has been very, very helpful. Thank, thank you all very much. So um, if you want to deliver additional comments, uh, suggestions, uh, links to information, uh, please go to the Green Mountain Care Board website. It's gmcboard.vermont.gov. And you'll have the opportunity there to select Act 167 community meetings. And please, you can make a comment, either a written comment, either with your name attached or without. They will all be posted. And we do monitor these and collect all of them. And so really would appreciate your doing that. At the bottom is my email directly to my own work account, bruce.hammery at oliverwyman.com. If you wish to send something there, I'm happy to get it. I will acknowledge I got it. Probably won't be able to have a lot of chat with you back and forth. We've got about 50 more of these meetings in the next three weeks. Um, so, But I, I would appreciate getting your comments, advice, and experience by either route. So thank you all very much. Appreciate your taking the time. Uh, thank you for your care to the people of Vermont. And uh, you all have a good evening and a good week. <laughs>